Today I'm going to be doing something I don't do very often on this channel, and that's going on a bit of a rant about a book that I read and didn't enjoy all that much. Today we're talking about Babel by R.F. Kuang. The story focuses on Robin Swift, who begins the story in Canton when he is surrounded by his dead family members, only to be rescued by a man called Robert Lavelle. Robert takes Robin under his wing, takes him to England and educates him, but Lovell is pretty stern and severe with Robin as he grows up. Eventually, Robin goes to Oxford University and joins the translation department, which is a fictionalised tower in the university. Within this tower are blocks of silver that are magical and can be activated by the use of language. This allows the people of England in Victorian London to do all kinds of magical and wonderful things. It also serves to be the prop of the British Empire, and this is something that Robin learns throughout the course of the story. Robert makes several friends at Oxford University, Raimi, Letty and Victoire, who are all part of the same cohort, but their friendship is torn apart as they realise the injustice of Babel and they have to pick sides. So I'll start with the positives of this book. I thought that the writing style was excellent. Kwong has a very nice writing style. It's simple but effective. It's eminently readable. Once I got into the story, which I did after about 40 pages, I just breezed through the whole thing. And that's not a criticism to say that it's simple. It's very effective and it's quite poetic and affecting in places. Some of the best parts of the novel for me are her descriptions of Oxford University, her descriptions of Canton, especially when Robin returns there after years of being away. I think she does that really effectively. I also think that the character of Robin throughout about two-thirds of the novel is an excellent character. He's someone who is torn between two cultures, two worlds and two languages. In the early part of the novel we have him acclimatising to English culture, which is very different from the culture that he grew up in. Kwong has some interesting passages here about language, the differences between them, and the impossibility or the ambiguities of translating between different languages. When Robin goes to Oxford, like most people I imagine who go there, at first he is inspired by the place, he falls into the sort of elitism of it, the allure of it, he's part of this big privileged club now, but slowly he realises that that's not quite what Oxford is about. He meets people that aren't great, and he meets academics who don't live up to the ideals that he thought they had. And this stuff is the best part of the novel for me. Robin's internal conflict between the allure of Oxford, the elitism, the privilege, and the actual stuff that's going on, and him eventually realising that Oxford isn't this dream that he made it out to be. Unfortunately, Robin's character does dip in the final part of the story. There are going to be spoilers for this review, so at this point you probably want to stop uh, listening. But if you don't care about spoilers, uh, please continue. At the beginning of the story, Robin joins this thing called the Hermes Society. This society steals silver bars from Babel Tower, and Potentially, it's unclear, but they seem to re redistribute them to countries in need of them. The British Empire holds onto these silver bars and uses it to prop up its power and maintain its power. And they don't share those bars with other people. And so Robin thinks that this is an injustice, which it is, and so he joins the society and starts stealing these bars. I should also be mentioned at this point that Robin's brother, half-brother, Griffin, is part of the society as well. Robin and Griffin are both the illegitimate sons of Robert Lovell, which explains why Robert uh, went and adopted Robin at the beginning of the story. What convinces me a bit less in the story is Robin's transformation from shy, reserved uh, cloister boy to basically radical terrorist by the end of the story. And we see him go through this transformation. He meets Griffin, his older half-brother, who is also the son of Robert Lavelle, who's part of this rebellious Hermes society, who is stealing silver bars from Babel and redistributing to countries that need them. And Griffin is very happy to commit violence against Babel. He sees the necessity of violence. And Robin seems to be on the fence about that. But something happens about two-thirds of the way through the story, and he just completely flips. And not only does he flip, but he basically goes on a power trip to the point where he's happy to destroy an entire country and to hell with the consequences. And I just didn't believe that switch. I think it went came too quickly. I don't think it was earned. And I think the author skirts a lot of important issues around this topic, which I'll also talk about later. But essentially for me, Robin's character just goes by the wayside at that point. He just becomes someone who he wasn't really at the beginning of the story and who I don't quite believe at this point. He becomes a mouthpiece for Kwong's ideas rather than a genuine character. And that leads me into my general criticism of every other character in this book, which is that none of them really come across as personalities. They're not really personalities. Instead, they're just identity groups, stereotypes, and that's about it. 
everyone at Oxford who happens to be a white male just fits into the stereotype of who you would think uh, would be at Oxford. They're all sort of rah-rah boys going around and sipping champagne and, they're, you know, they're just there spending daddy's money and they don't care about their education. They bully people, they're racist, they even sexually assault one of the characters or try to at one point. Just every stereotype of the sort of British elite class she just throws in. And all of the characters are like that. When it comes to the scholars themselves, it's kind of the same. Robert Lavelle is, as I said, Robin's father, and there's a lot of interesting tension here. And there are little points in the story where Kwong tries to humanise Lavelle slightly, but she always runs away from it. He's just a monster. And this, again, is one of the issues. All of the bad characters are just monsters. And the only character with a degree of complexity is Letty. She is a character who belongs to the co Robin's cohort. They begin as friends. Later on, things become more complicated. And... But when she ultimately betrays them, she just becomes a stereotypical white girl who can't handle other people uh, being oppressed. And so that's why she betrays her friends. And this just really bugs me because it just doesn't come across as a real story. Instead, what we have is Kwong with her ideas and her stereotypes and every character just falls in line with them. Perhaps the most egregious example of this comes when Robin storms the tower and takes it over. He basically lines up the academics, gives a rousing speech, and tells them that they can either stay in the tower and help him, or they can leave. And the line is something to the effect of, all the Europeanists and classicists, i.e. all the white scholars, leave, and everyone that stays is non-white. With the exception of one white female scholar, of course, because she's a woman. So because she's a white woman, she kind of gets some oppression points. So she can sort of sit in the middle. And in a way, it's only really the white women in this story that make moral choices because they actually sit at the intersection of oppression and power. And so they actually have a choice to make. Everyone else just fits into the oppressor, oppressed class. And all of their, uh, pretty much all of their actions can be predicted on the basis of that. This scene actually reminded me a lot of Harry Potter in the seventh book when all the Slytherins just refused to help in the Battle of Hogwarts. And you just think to yourself, really, wasn't there just one Slytherin or a handful of Slytherins who maybe did want to help? And I just feel a similar thing with this story. It's not that I disagree with Kwong's politics per se. It's just that she is so one note about all of it. And she's so unwilling to recognize that, you know, a rich white male might actually be on the side of justice in this debate and that maybe someone who a person of color on the side might be on the side of, of britain you know and so that really bugged me and then there was another scene just a few pages later when they are deciding how far to take their violence so essentially they've realized that these gold bars the empire rests on them it's like in the infra infrastructure of the buildings if they're not maintained it'll all collapse and so they're basically starving out britain by keeping hold of these silver magic bars and the, she basically says all the young people want to escalate and all the old people want to dial a step back and again it's just this stereotype of oh yeah obviously the young people are more radical because they're young and passionate and obviously the old people are going to be more reserved because they're old and have more skin in the game or whatever and i just think it's so dull to have that as the way that you tell a story because basically you can just predict whatever is go a character is going to do based on the identity group that they belong to. It's not subtle, it's very stereotypical, and it just ruins what actually in terms of the plot could be a very interesting story. So this is probably my main criticism of the book. I just didn't feel like any of the characters had genuine personalities. They were just, you know, mouthpieces for Kwong's ideas. Uh, basically, you could just reduce everything about them to an identity group. And I just felt that, that was disappointing, especially because there are parts of the novel where it seems like she's going to engage in subtlety and then just doesn't. So, for example, with the character of Griffin, when we meet him, he seems quite disturbed. He is quite violent. He threatens to kill Robin at one point. And we know that he also killed someone, a former friend even, quite brutally. And so it seems like, you know, that you could have him as a character who, although he's on the side of justice, maybe he goes too far. Maybe the fact that he's killed people has actually had a negative effect on him and has made him a bit unhinged. But what happens when this character dies is that we get a footnote from Kwong telling us that the murder that happened actually was just an accident and he's really just a good person after all. And that is just the worst kind of moralizing. It's not just moralizing within the story, but the fact that you're including footnotes because you can't find a way to actually put that in the content of the story to get a moral point across. 
ugh, it's awful. <laughs> it's just some of the worst moralizing I've ever come across. And actually, I'm not going to talk about the footnotes very much, but that to me is, again, just that use of footnotes to moralize constantly. If you want to have a moral message in your story, convey it through the story. If you have to add footnotes to remind the reader how they're supposed to respond, it suggests that maybe you're not very good at telling your moral message through the story. Now I want to talk about the major theme, or one of the major themes of the story, which is the necessity of violence, which happens to be the tagline of the novel as well. So clearly Kwong is trying to make a point here about, in order to stand up sometimes, you do have to commit violence. And this is something that I broadly agree with. If you just sit as a pacifist while you're being oppressed, what reason does your oppressor have to change anything? It is a sad truth of reality that sometimes, in order to make a better world for yourself, you have to do serious things. You have to go to extreme lengths. And, you know, as sad as that is. But that always does come with a cost. And if you read novelists who have actually been to war, like Tolkien, for example, you get that in his stories. You get that war sometimes is necessary, but he's not afraid to convey the real costs of war in a compassionate way. And that, to me, is what makes a war novelist really good, when they can do that, when they can recognize the necessity of something extreme, but also point out that it does come at a cost. And also point out that sometimes it doesn't even get people where they think it will either. Now, what annoys me with this is that although the novel frames itself as pushing this, it skirts the issue of violence so much. And the way it does this is by having the climax of the story take place within Babel Tower. We have these silver bars which are connected to the infrastructure of Britain. Uh, you know, it's in the buildings, it's in London Bridge, and if they just keep Babel Tower secure, these silver bars will basically degrade in these places, so London Bridge falls down because it's, it's protected by these bars. All of Oxford rots to the ground, the sewers, like, explode, and, you know, disease everywhere. There's a comparison to the, you know, the plagues of Egypt, which is very apt. Uh, and so, you know, you're literally destroying an entire country here by keeping hold of these bars. But by keeping the characters and the audience at a distance from the consequences, because they are just inside the tower, not doing anything. They're not down on the ground watching people starve to death or clubbing people to death with, you know, you know battle axes, swords, and the like. They're able to do it from literally the ivory tower, which just happens to be a very convenient way to distance yourself and the reader from the real costs of doing something like this. And I think that's a bit hypocritical. I think in a novel that is going to push for violent action, for you to just not engage with that and for you to gloss over that and for you to just create this situation where the characters can cause all this mayhem from the safety of an ivory tower, it just comes across as disingenuous to me. And it also comes across like you're not really engaging with your primary theme. It's all well and good to say that violence is sometimes necessary, but for you to create a situation where characters don't really have to deal with the ramifications of that just comes across as a bit hypocritical to me. And it also comes across like you don't really understand the true ramifications of political violence. I also want to talk about this Ivory Tower University thing, because the story... <laughs> Clearly, this is inspired by the author's research as, as a linguist, as a translator, um, and it seems like a novel that almost is inflating the sense of importance of academia. I mean, the fact that the power of the empire is just seated in Oxford University and with these translation scholars, it just comes across as not very believable. Um, you know, I am an academic and I do think academia is important. But I wouldn't want to overstress the importance of it, per se. I think that this sort of story acts as a kind of maybe wish fulfillment on the part of the author, maybe thinking that academia means more than it actually does by creating this fantasy where it is literally the power centre of empire. That just seems to be a little bit of a stretch. And it's the, it, the last thing I want to talk about is the brittle magic system. So one of the issues with the magic system is that it's not really integrated well into the world. So Babel is to some extent a historical novel. It is set in the Victorian period. It is about colonialism and it, in its footnotes it references, you know, not just things in the fictional world moralizing, but it also refers to genuine historical facts. So it's clear that the novel is indicating to the reader that it is meant to be about an actual historical period. And that's fine, of course, a novel can do that. That's That can be a very interesting way to tell a novel. But the author obviously drops in this silver, this magic, into the world. The problem with this is that the author doesn't really consider how that would have ramifications on the world itself. Basically, England is much the same that it would have been without sil this magic silver, 
It's just that they have it. <laughs> and so that just to me seems to betray a lack of imagination because if you're going to introduce something like magic into a world, that's going to have changes. The art wouldn't be the same. Dickens is mentioned in the novel, but would he have written the same novels that he wrote in the real world if there was that silver? I'm not convinced. The same with the Industrial Revolution. All the strikes and the Luddites are mentioned in this story. But would that have happened in the same way if it was silver that was causing um, people to lose their jobs rather than you know, the, the explosion of industry and tech? These are things that the author doesn't really address, but she needs to because they're elements of her story. And so this, to me, doesn't really work. The magic doesn't really fit into the world. It just seems like we've got a world and we've just thrown in this thing and not fully considered the ramifications of it. Another example of this is the fact that Babel Tower is so easily stormed by Robin. He basically just walks in there and he's able to take it down. And you would think that if this silver really was the power center of the empire, that it would be protected. You know, think of the atom bomb. Do you think that the atom bomb was just put in a little tower where, where scholars are just, you know, working away on it without any kind of military protection? Of, now, the tower does have some degree of protection. There are these little booby trap things that go off that are also created by the scholars, but it would have more protection than that, I would think. And I would think that the, par the parliament would know that this was the centre of their power, and so they would do a lot more to protect it than just have scholars bubbling about in the, in, in the tower. So again, it's just not a very believable story. It's not a believable magic system, and the idea that you would just have this silver there, the centre of all this power, and not protected... I just can't suspend my disbelief uh, enough for that, I'm afraid. I think the reason why this is there is just to give a very easy MacGuffin-style plot. There is one silver bar, because of course there is, in the tower, and it's unstable, and if used in a certain way, it will basically make everything else unstable and everything goes to hell, basically. And Robin realises this, and he does this at the end of the story, and basically destroys the entire empire in consequence, or at least damages it quite substantially anyway. And it just seems like the purpose of this is so that the characters can just win at the end of the day. Because of course, two scholars couldn't really bring down an empire. Empire is way more complicated than that. Political power is way more complicated than that. You can't just reduce something to a single resource that when destroyed, destroys everything. And again, it sort of betrays, in my view, the author's maybe simplistic understanding of colonialism and empire and power because she's just reducing it to one thing. She reduces it to identity groups, she reduces it to silver, and it all comes down and it all fits together so easily. And to me, that's just not a very insightful story. You know, if you're going to engage with these issues, you have to engage with them in a way that's complicated and interesting. And to me, by reducing everything to this silver, the whole empire's power to the silver, it just doesn't really work and comes across as a bit shallow. So unfortunately, I just didn't enjoy Babel all that much. Um, it was a shame because I, I really think there, there are moments in the story where she approaches some kind of subtlety or nuance, and it's a shame that we never fully go there. Everyone just falls into their identity group lines. It's full of stereotypes and cliches that I think even if you agree with her political position, you should even acknowledge that there's no real insight here. Like, even if you agree that colonialism is just this, you know, the greatest evil of all time, um, you would still think to yourself reading this, okay, sure, but have you actually put anything forward here that's insightful? I agree with you, but is there anything new here? Is there an insight that we're missing? And it just doesn't seem to me that there is. There's nothing that I learnt by reading this story at all. And I just think its analysis of colonialism, of race, of gender, of all of this stuff is very simple, very predictable, <laughs> and not that interesting. So ultimately, I just didn't enjoy this book very much. I think it was well written. I do think it has a very likable protagonist. And in a way, I'm still glad that I read the story because while reading it, I did still have a good time. And if I abstracted away from what it was trying to say about the real world and took it as a story within itself, I was actually able to enjoy it a lot more. Unfortunately, the story doesn't really let you do that because, again, you have these footnotes that are pointing to it, the title of the story or the subtitle, on the necessity of violence, it's clearly meant to be a message story. So you can't really ignore that and actually understand what the novel is about. You have to accept that that's what it's doing. And it's just not doing it in a very insightful way, as far as I can see. 
I think the magic system is a bit of a MacGuffin. I think it's superficial and it doesn't really consider the implications of what that kind of magic system would do in the world. And the characters, with the exception of Robin, just come across as very flat. And again, they're not really characters, they're just identity groups. All right, that is it for this video. If you have read Babel, I'd like to know your thoughts on it, especially if you enjoyed the book, because for me, I always, you know, it's, it's fun to talk to people who really enjoy something that you didn't enjoy. You know, so if you did like it, what was it about the book? Do you think it had some insights that I missed? Do you think I'm being unfair on its characters? Let me know down in the comments what your thoughts are. Otherwise, take care, everyone. Ta-ra.